Okay, this is a journal addendum. Still looking at the 69. I'm trying to understand why 918. Okay. Is there? I really ought to put that footnote in here. It's there in the e-chart, but it's not here. Okay, but you can access it here. In 919, you can also access. Okay, but those are the only two places that you can get those notes. I'm going to have to redo the page and create them as links here because they're not right now, as you can see. Um, that's some explanation about the 69. But what I'm really trying to focus on is what in the text, okay? Here's 9-7 that talks about, you know, when it was. And we already know it's a Solomon. All right. And here in 9-18, we also know when it is, which I've already covered in the, you know, video just done. And there's more to say about it here, which I haven't, you know, looked at this in like over a year. But before I even look at what you see highlighted in black, I want to just ignore it. Because I always go back through my stuff without looking at what I said before. Okay, it's the closest I've got to, you know, as it were, a double blind test. Because I'm going against myself. Because I don't have anybody else who's done this kind of research. So I can only go against myself and hope that you'll go against me too with some kind of substance. Okay, so the text then is really what I want to look at. And the question is, what is in the text of 9-7 that ties to the text of 9-18 to justify this being a bookend at 69? Okay? So here's 9-7, and this time, you know, you got the Hebrew and the Greek. Bear in mind that the, the Greek versions are often a lot alike, but this is Theodosian, and it's, it's you know, got some changes. But pretty much everybody agrees that, you know, you always go to the Masoretic first. That's not always a good idea, okay? What's basically been happening throughout the centuries with the Hebrew text is that they destroy copies where they think there are substantial errors instead of preserving them. In the West, we have exactly the opposite approach. We preserve all the texts, whether they got errors in them or not. And the advantage of the latter approach is so that you can diagnose what went wrong, where it went wrong, if it is wrong, because a lot of times, what people thought was wrong in the past was right. And I, the dramatic example of that is Jude, where he's using ethnacy. Everybody in your normal Bibles from, from today in the translation, you won't find ethnacy in Jude. It should be there. Because he wrote it in meter, and ethnacy makes that meter work. It's real obvious that it's missing. Okay? It's like my saying, Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb himself would and then stopped. Well, you know it's only one syllable left. Okay. So the same thing is true here when it comes to certain things with Daniel. But more importantly, Daniel would be playing on keywords as well as meter because we know the 69s you know are the same so we know that we've got the right words okay but he's going to tie his words in his text it's 69 syllables here okay see 69 69 syllables Solomon through Asas 11th year okay and then it's 69 syllables here, so it's obviously deliberate in 918. Okay, well, here's 918. All right. 
This also 60, 69 syllables. Okay, so what's the similarity in the text? All right, 97, we'll use the English to make it simpler. Okay, here's 97 in the main translations. And it's, you know, I mean, it's, let's show it with the Hebrew side by side. Okay. All right, to you, to, it, it's really dramatic in Hebrew. To you, righteousness, God. Okay, see, Adonai. To us, open shame. Okay, now the thing that's kind of interesting here is that, well, let me show you. The word that he's using for shame. How did I get that? I hate the strong thing. Let me turn it off. Thank you. Okay. Strong's is really, if you have to use strong's to understand the scripture, you're never going to learn it. Okay. Shame is boshet. Okay. See, that's boshet. Let me hold it. See? Now that's really interesting because that was the name that Saul gave one of his kids. And that's right here. Okay. So I'm thinking, all right, we need to see Boshet in verse 18 because that's really what he's talking about. Okay, but he doesn't. He uses Shamem here. That was a real shock to me. Okay, where's Shamem? See, here's Shamem. All right. And that's, where is it? I have trouble reading the block letters. Plus, I don't have my glasses on. Where is Shamem? That's name. He's playing on Shamem versus Shem. See, you get Shamem if you don't have Shem. If you're not playing to 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 Shem, then you got Shamem. See this this Shema, Shamem. Okay, and Shem. Okay, he's playing. He's playing on the sound. And there, that should be it. Yeah, here we go. See, and it's spaced. It's spaced apart. The sound is being repeated in different combinations. So you got Shema, all right, versus Shamem, Shamemenu. Isn't that right? Shamemenu. Shamenu. Shametenu, sorry. And then Shemeka, your name. And see how he's doing that funny thing? Okay, it has more resonance in English than it does in Hebrew because the other word he's using in verse 7 is boshet. Okay, right here. It doesn't have the sound alliterative, you know, similarity that it does in English because shame and shamem sound a lot alike. And we translate this with the word shame. Okay, so you can see the connection to shamem in English. Okay, but the concepts are, are, are similar. All right, so I'm thinking, okay, that's one thing he's using as a word tie. But, you know, so then I thought, okay, well, let me look at 17, which is not where he closes the paragraph. Because his petition starts in 15. I mean, I should, should really just show you this textually. Okay, he's he's doing his preamble to the petition. Okay, he's he's if you didn't know what he was doing, you would say he's trying to butter up God. You God who brought your people out of Egypt. See, this is all about the Gentiles. So that's why he's mentioning Gentile nation. He's in the part of his prophecy where he's going to be talking about where he's talking about. Prophecy to the Gentiles, which is the man of time, which is, you know, four parts Gentile. 
So now he's bringing up the fact that God brought us out of Egypt, brought you out of the land of the Gentiles, the quintessential Gentile, you know, moniker. All right. We have sinned, but you, your God, you delivered us anyway. Because you know what? When God delivered them out of Egypt, they wanted to go back. They didn't like being delivered by God. They wanted to go back to the leeks and garlics of Egypt. They fought against Moses. They complained the whole time. A whole bunch of them ended up having to die in the wilderness. Okay, that's in Numbers 14. You can read it yourself. They didn't like it. So it's not like the people were, uh, what do you want to call it, good. They were kvetchers. That's a Yiddish word for complainers, always bitching. That's what they're like. You can read it yourself in Deuteronomy and Numbers and Exodus. Okay? So, his petition starts before he closes the paragraph. Hi, you delivered us out from the Gentiles. Butter up. Okay? We have sinned. You did good. We did bad. We sinned. Then he goes in the second one. Okay? See, you're righteous. Now that ties back to verse 7. See? Tzaddik. Alright. You're Tzaddik and we're Boshet. So it's like, okay, he's sort of leading into it now. Okay? So you're righteous. We're shame. In accordance with your righteousness, because you're the same guy who took us out of Egypt, now turn your anger and wrath away from, and get this, your city. Not turn your wrath away from us. Turn your wrath away from your city. Your city, your holy mountain, because of our sins, because your city and your people have become a reproach. See, this is the petition. Verse 16 is the official petition. Verse 14 was the transition. Verse 15 is the preamble. In other words, he's invoking uh, the preamble. Um, purpose of a preamble is to invoke um, past case law or something that, that shows that what I'm going to ask you to do, you've already done before. In other words, it's consistent with justice. Justice is always concerned about the past because it's concerned about consistency. Okay, so that's what he's doing with verse 15. Verse 16 now is the actual um, petition. Turn away your anger from, and he's, he's really careful to say, the city and your mountain. Yes, it's our fault, but the fact of the matter remains that your city and your people have become a reproach to what? The Gentiles. See, his whole thing is focusing on the man of time, the promise to the Gentiles, the promise of deliverance to the Gentiles. And sort of sotto voce, you can see him saying, okay, we screwed up, but there are other people besides us. And you didn't just pick us for us. You picked us for them. So forgive us for their sake. Rebuild your city and your holy mountain for their sake. You put me in this Babylon place. You're having me rule a Gentile nation. Okay, so now I'm asking you to rule in your house, in your city, over us for the sake of the Gentile nations. You see how cool this is? So he's he's very he's got a really great legal mind. I wish I was as smart as him. Okay, so now in verse 17, so now God listen to the prayer of your servant. Now he's getting personal. And to his supplication for your sake. Now, this sounds like it's obsequious, but it's not. He's invoking 1 Kings 9. You gotta go look it up. There, and this is where we get our tie to Solomon. Okay. In 1 Kings 9, Solomon prayed, Hi. When we screw up, if anybody turns toward Jerusalem and prays to you, hear his prayer. So Daniel is invoking the legal clause that who? That Solomon, see, because this is a, the paragraph that begins with Solomon. 
that Solomon himself said. He's invoking what Solomon said. And so therefore he's getting ready to close the paragraph that begins with Solomon. And this is the close of it. Incline your ear, open your eyes and see. See, we closed our ears to you. We closed our eyes to you. Okay. We are now Shamem. And of course in verse 7 it was Boshet. Okay. And again, the city Okay, we went toward the city, which is called by your name. All of this text in verse 18, as which ends it, sort of, and all this text in 17 is all in 1 Kings 9 that Solomon said. So there's our textual tie. When Solomon was still, you know, in fellowship with God, because he didn't end that way. When he was still in fellowship with God, this is the text that he used. This is what he said in 1 Kings 9. You can go read it yourself. So that explains why verse 18 is 16, 69 syllables. Okay, verse 18, 69 syllables. He's closing with what Solomon said in 1 Kings 9. He's invoking that legal language. Because pretty much all the language here is language that Solomon actually used. Okay, so then verse 19 ends up being like it were a new final pro paragraph. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. For your sake, do not delay. Solomon didn't say that. Daniel's saying that. That's his final closing statement. So it isn't as repetitive as it sounds once you know, and again, this is why the meter is so important. Once you know that, oh, this is meter. This is meant to be open, close. From Solomon on, leaving David out. That's real important. From Solomon solo all the way through to verse 18, where he invokes 1 Kings 9. That's a paragraph. And the reason why it includes the 42 and to a certain extent the closing of the 49 is because he's weaving in, he's enmeshing the promise to the Gentiles, which is what his text is basically saying. See, in verse 18, well, we'll start in 17. Okay. Let your face shine. That's, you know, wording that's evocative of what Solomon had said. But principally here, see the desolations called by your name. See? City, that's called by your name. We're not presenting supplications based on our merit, but on account of your great compassion. See why that works? And that means forget about us. You had a promise that you made to other people besides us, but you made us the chosen people, so you got to restore us. Now, the reason why I think that's really important that I wish somebody would, you know, really delve into, maybe do his doctrine on it and teach it, is because one of the things that we're missing out on in Christendom is that we don't understand that we're going to be blessed as being chosen, even when we don't deserve it. Of course, we never do deserve it. But, I mean, even when we're apostate, we get blessed for the sake of those who don't, you know, who haven't yet made the decision to believe in Christ. For the sake of those who maybe did believe in Christ, but they don't believe now. And we have to be blessed and be here so that they get enough time to change their mind. Okay? Because there's a whole lot of junk going on in Christianity and Judaism, for that matter. It says, well, if you have a nice life on this planet, then you must be a good spiritual person. Baloney. And Daniel's prayer here shows that. Okay. Now, what other ties are there in the text to this voting period? Well, but Daniel's voting. That's what 918 is. It's Daniel's vote. Daniel's voting that God listen. Daniel's praying, the prayer is a vote. Okay?
Daniel's voting. Yeah, and it makes a great deal of sense to pitch this, you know, to the voting period because this is the historical voting period. It's literally running, there's a little bit of an overlap. It begins at 467 BC and it ends at 397 BC, which is when canon will close when Malachi finishes up his book. Okay, but that's a historical voting period. So, what cleverer way to show that than to have the text be a vote? Daniel's voting to ask God, and he's asking God to vote to, to restore the city and restore the temple. That's clever. And the vote is for what? For the sake of the Gentiles who are going to be alive during the voting period. So they can vote with their feet and go to Israel too. Not because of what we've done, but because of your promise, and specifically invoking the promise to them. Now, that sounds pretty convincing, doesn't it? You got something better to say or something better than what I know? Please tell me. I'm all ears because that's what that is. Asking God to vote. That's why it's 69. It's one syllable short there because God might say no. But Daniel's voting. So are we going to vote? That's the theme of this whole thing. Vote for God. Vote to know God. Okay? Because he's not going to pressure you into voting for him. And if you don't, then you know what's going to happen. And if you do, it helps protect humanity, too. It's the best thing you can do, most patriotic thing you can do for your country is to vote to learn God. And there you go as your reasons why. Now, I still haven't explained 47 enough, and I'll have to do that in some future increment.